what I wanted to do uh, about two years ago, I wanted to explore how do fashion media uh, make us buy stuff or how do the, they encourage us to buy more things. So I have embarked on this really old journey, trying to understand the narratives, trying to understand the mechanics of what exactly we can read in the fashion magazines, fashion newspapers, columns, uh, what do we see on the influencer accounts that uh, excites us to go to the shop and you know, spend our pounds, euros, whatever it is, to buy the stuff that we may not even need. And lots of that stuff has an impact on the planet. So you can take this research as a part of inquiry into like lifestyle journalism as a whole. What does it bring to the table of climate narratives? Because there's like the whole different field of climate communication, but that's all part of the big story. Okay, so without further ado, let's see. Oh my gosh, one second. Here we go. So, okay, which industry do you think produces more carbon emissions? Is it the clothing industry? Is it the air transport? Can somebody make a guess in the chat? Don't Google. Let's see. Clothing, clothing. Of course, you're here. You probably guess the answer is clothing. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Clothing, clothing. Yes, indeed. Funnily enough, or weirdly enough, uh, if we look at the numbers, You've got 10% of global emissions generated clothing industry and just 2% of global carbon emissions generated by air transport. How come, right? One thing is, uh, you know, take a, a flight somewhere, it's plenty of burned fossil fuels used. The problem with clothing is you've got various stages of um, the life cycle of clothes. So you've got the production stage, you've got the stage of using the clothes, and you've got the stage of uh, getting rid of the clothes meaning that each of those parts is generating lots of emissions. Uh, you need lots of water to produce cotton. You need lots of power to use the color dyes in the factories. Uh, you need to power the massive machines to industrialize production, mostly in developing countries that are mostly affected by the climate change. Then when we use clothes, we need to transport them um, across the globe. We need to power the shops to sell them. We need to power the delivery. And then when we no longer want our clothes, and it's a fact that an average item spends just two years in the UK wardrobe. Uh, so we just throw them in the landfill. Maybe we think we throw them kind of into the charity shop basket. Some of these things have been sold. Some of the, uh, these things, they end up in the landfill in developing countries. So it's very, very complicated. Some things can be recycled, others less so. But overall, as a life cycle of a clothing item of the clothing industry, we end up with 10% of global carbon emissions, which is similar to cement, if you want to look into more like, you know, hardcore uh, emission emitters. Well, emission emitters, I need my coffee. Okay, so what else can I ask you about? Which do you think is more sustainable? I got two items of clothing, uh, a pair of jeans, and this uh, nicely looking dress. Which one is more sustainable? Okay, let's see the little chat. Uh oh, uh oh, no. Yes, somebody says jeans, somebody says the dress. Okay, okay, okay. Funnily enough, yes, thank you. The dress, the jeans. I mean, you already see the answer on the screen that it's complicated, to put it mildly. So it takes 10,000 liters of water to produce a pair of jeans. It's literally uh, 14 years of drinking needs of a human. So it uses lots of water, uses lots of cotton. Cotton is responsible for the drying of land, for the air pollution, for the really awful uh, working conditions for the people in the factories. On the other hand, it's a natural fabric. So it's much easier to recycle. It's much easier for that to, you know, uh, find its place in the landfill and not cause much damage. On the other hand, you've got this dress, which doesn't cost much. Uh, it's fairly easy to produce. It doesn't take lots of water. It's polyester. The problem is the production releases double the emissions compared to a pair of jeans. Um, 
And also once you are kind of, when you're using it, uh, it releases microplastics into your washing machine and then back into the ocean. And when you no longer need it, a few years down the line, you throw it away and it stays uh, forever. So it takes hundreds of years for the polyester to get into smaller particles. Um, so eventually it's uh, a dress that's supposed to last, but we don't really use it like that. Yeah, there is a really nice infographic that Anna is suggesting in the chat. So it's complicated. That's what I'm trying to say. Even if you think you can opt for natural fabrics and you feel better about yourselves, if you buy one pair of jeans in a lifetime, perhaps yes. But if you have you know, a polyester dress, uh, it doesn't take up the resources, but the other stages of the life cycle are really problematic. Um, usually the environmental academics uh, or campaigners or journalists um, from the good side of the spectrum, they say the most sustainable wardrobe is the one you already have. That's good enough, but uh, having said that, we're all humans. We have our desires, we have our needs, we have our ambitions. So it's hard to stop buying clothes, but it's also hard to navigate the industry, the whole media world of, of clothing. So that's why I want to talk about uh, how the media tell us this story. Okay. And just one more question to get us going. Uh, recycled polyester, that sounds like a solution. So we take this nasty plastic-based fabrics, we recycle them, we make something new out of them. It can still last a long time. Uh, we're happy customers. Mm, factories are busy, you know, people uh, still have their jobs and whatnot. Um, what do you think? Is that the solution? Can there be any challenges, any issues that we're not thinking about? Recycled polyester, are we happy with that? Not really. <laughs> okay. Why not? If not, maybe you're happy. You can say that in the chat. That's fine by me. No, you're not sure. That's fine. Intensive process. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, it's still a process, so you've got to switch on the machine, the lights, the the factory has to be open, people have to come. Okay, anything else? Mankind must exist. We can't exist without clothing. Oh, believe me, there is enough clothing and food already produced. But you're right that we can't just stop producing and be happy with what we have, especially those parts of the world that don't have what we have. Okay, uh -huh. so you say your level of emission leads overproduction. You'd rather keep the genes, is an infinite. Okay, mm -hmm. you've got really good ideas there, honestly. Um, I would probably agree with most of the things you're suggesting. So some of the issues with the idea that we can just recycle the clothes uh, most of the time and like polyester, first of all, the processes are still not developed enough. I mean, the whole recycling industry, it's really in its infant stage, to be perfectly honest. So in this case, if you make trainers out of the recycled polyester, it cannot be recycled further. It's plastic, right? So it's a breeding ground for the bacteria that causes body odor. So you may be you know, very cheerful about your um, climate credentials, but not as much about you know, certain kind of ones. Uh, also, so the idea that we can just recycle and be made gives us an excuse to shop more. Um, it's a catch-22. I know that. Uh, it's really hard just to stop buying, to stop producing, and it's not likely to be possible. That's why we're here today to just talk on solutions. Academia is all about posing the question and have the answers, and we can try to brainstorm together. So what's the issue? Fashion is among the top polluters, as you can see from the statistics, as you can see from the like lifestyle, especially in the global uh, West, global North. Fashion brands have a heavy influence uh, on the content and the budget of the media. So if you think about the traditional fashion magazines, they're very often sustained by the advertising. They're often sustained by the fashion weeks, by the exposure to celebrities, to the designers, so it's the industry that cannot live without the media, but at the same time, the media cannot live without the access to the industry. 
You also have an issue of a certain crisis happening with the professional media. Uh, people don't buy newspapers, people don't like to buy subscriptions, they can barely pay for newsletters, uh, people hate paywall, paywalls. That's why it's even harder to produce quality journalism without relying on the commercial streams of income. You have websites and social media that dominate the market. Most students that I teach would say, look, I actually do get my news from the social media in the morning. I don't start with The Guardian or The New York Times. Completely understand that's the lifestyle we have. So that's why it's important to understand what do the professional media have to say about fashion and sustainability and what do the social media stars add uh, to the topic. How do we measure sustainability? When it comes to uh, fashion specifically, in all kinds of sustainability discussions, uh, whether it's clothes or cement or building railway, it's really complicated. I mean, electric cars, complicated. Fashion, complicated. So that's the bad news, right? There is no easy solution. And the harder it is, the harder it is good to communicate to the audience. Good news is that lots of great minds are looking into it. Um, I'm not talking about myself, other you know, better people have started. I'm just following up. So how do we measure sustainability in clothing? First, think about the before. So what are the resources that have been used? Whether it was cotton, whether it was the water, uh, the heat, how the clothes were produced. Uh, is it about the fabric that is creating a winds, a uh, change of the environment? Is it the cashmere goats that have been overproduced and that impacts the habitat in certain parts of the world? Is it the oral sea? Uh, that is now becoming almost extinct because of all the cotton factories that operate on its shores. There's a really good uh, documentary by Stacey Dooley and her team about the impact on the very like real visual habitat. Never mind the uh, temperature. So also the pollution doesn't help uh, the deforestation to generate certain kinds of uh, energy to uh, power the factories. So it's really complicated. The resources are finite. That's why we need to take this into account. Then when we have the piece in our wardrobe, the longer we use it, the better. Even it's a pair of jeans, even it's a pair of something really not great resources wise. If we use it for 20, 25 years, that famous pair of jeans that you mentioned in the chat, much better for the environment, okay? Um, having said that, if you have pieces made from plastic-based fabrics, they will also be releasing plastic back in nature. Uh, and after, the afterlife of clothes is as important as the before and the during wearing stages. Recycling and upcycling is much better than throwing away. There is a big myth about the shops that I briefly mentioned, um, the statistics show that even if we think that we are like giving our good or not so good clothes to the charity shops, they cannot possibly be sold given the amount of space, given the amount of interest. And lots of the stuff will be sold as like a second hand uh, into the developing countries in the world, meaning that you just create more pollution in those places that cannot sustain that amount of stuff so we just keep outsourcing the production of our stuff and the, um, let's say, the waste created by our stuff. Again, to the countries that are much less uh, fortunate than ours. Recycling is good. So you may want to kind of reuse an item, do something else from it. Maybe you want to buy secondhand. There are so many websites about it. Upcycling is not bad. All is better than burning. All is better than landfill. But again, as you can see, all these solutions, they are not uh, at the level that everybody is using them. Uh, it's not for everyone, recycle, three second hand. But that's, I think, the scheme that can be really helpful for you if you're looking at the sustainability of clothes before, during, after the life cycle. But fashion is so complicated. Okay, It's not just about covering our bodies to protect from the heat or from the snow. It's really related to the psychology. Um, it's about our self-esteem. We need to look the part. We want to feel good about ourselves. That's why sometimes we use clothes for that. It can be about compulsive buying. Maybe we're having a really bad day in the office. You go and you buy something to cheer you up. Sometimes it can also cause the feeling of guilt. If we buy too many things, it can lead to impulsive decisions. 
we may be overwhelmed with the anxiety of choice. Uh, there are so many things, there are strengths. It's really hard to choose what is the right thing, what is trendy, what's good for our body shape, what's good for our self-identity. So it's complicated. It's already a space of a certain anxiety for so many people. Sociology of fashion is important. Status consumption. Uh, if you ever done a job interview, I'm sure many of you did, you probably thought what you're supposed to wear for that or even for an exam or even for an occasion. So we always try to you know, choose certain clothes that would represent our professional self, our romantic self, our easygoing self. Um, fit in or stand out, um, even shopping with friends. They're all parts of our social beings that we express through fashion. And then green is really hard. I cannot even tell you like five easy solutions, how to be the greenest person in the room. Yeah, if you cannot buy stuff for 25 years, you win. But at the same time, you also need to be you know, happy, social, and feel good about yourself. So it's hard. There is lots of sanctity marketing uh, or greenwashing when people tell you brands like Uniqlo or H&M, they say, look, we've got a green line where you're in good hands. You can just buy from us the organic cotton. But then you look, all other lines are not really green. And what is being green? If you dive into it, there are investigations that show lots of greenwashing that's happening. And last but not least, we can also face a sustainable consumption paradox, meaning that if we are trying to learn as much as we can about being sustainable, we may end up in so much overwhelming uh, swirls of information that we end up just giving up on the whole thing. Because, oh, it's about it to shop locally. Oh, it's about it to be crowdfunded. But what about those communities in less privileged parts of the world? Should we not support them through our buying? So all these paradoxes, they're hard to solve. And we are busy people, so we may as well give up. These are just some of the psychological, sociological, and um, green media paradoxes to keep in mind. Okay, so now... On my research, how exactly do fashion media and influencers encourage unsustainable consumption? But before I tell you what I did and what I found, I want you to have a close look at this headline and to tell me if there is anything wrong with that, anything puzzling, anything that is phrased in a weird way and you could phrase it differently. So very popular, probably the most popular um, tabloid newspaper in the world, Daily Mail, published this little story, 2018. What do you think of the headline? The choice of words, is that correct? Would you change anything? You can post in the chat if you have something, some views. Mm, thank you very much. Yes, outfit repeating is presented as something they should be praised for, although it's just normal. Yes, very good. Exactly. Yeah, anyone else? Terminology, any use of um, words here that is puzzling, weird. Just the headline, don't worry about reading everything. Well, it's not the long one anyways. Okay, yeah, uh huh, thank you. You don't think it's wrong for them to repeat outfits? Uh huh. Okay, yeah, a bit of sexism. Well, you can always expect some from Daily Mail, never fails about that. Essentially, greenwashing, yeah, royals are into sustainable fashion. Repeating is bad for celebrities, thank you very much. That's a very good point for the discourse analysis because it sounds like Oh, wow, that's out of normal to repeat an outfit. Yeah. So meaning that normal is not repeating outfit. Very good. How about the word recycling? 
did she make this dress from curtains, right? Is it, is it a carpet? It's a dress made to be a dress. It's not recycling. Yeah, as you say, it's repeating clothes, which is as normal as it gets. That's what we all do, right? Recycling is a very confusing choice of word in this case, because they're not recycling. They're literally reusing. And that's rather emblematic of the whole confusion about the terminology, the vocabulary of sustainability. And that's just one example of a massive national newspaper making the whole bus of people wearing the same stuff twice, meaning that we're really far from sustainability. So what I did for my study, I tried to look at every single bit of fashion media related communication in the UK. I looked at all the magazines, Vogue, Elle, Marie Claire, Grazie, Cosmo. I looked at the uh, bi-weekly magazines and the weekly magazines. They look into celebrities. Um, okay, hello, hit. I checked out the columns uh, related to fashion in the national newspapers. Uh, the Guardian, Times, Daily Mail, Evening Sun, Daily Mirror. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. You're, you're, many of you are suggesting in the chat that reusing clothes is as normal as it gets, right? So you shouldn't really, really be praising people for that. Right, so I look at the magazines, the newspapers, uh, very popular, influential online websites, Refinery29, Men Repeller, the influencers, the top fashion influencers on the Instagram and uh, blogs, Kim Kardashian, Kendall Jenner, Bella Hadid, Gary Ferrani, Alexa Chung, so on and so forth. Uh, I also looked at the TV personalities because they're really popular, perhaps more with the middle-aged consumers. Holly Willoughby, Rochelle Humes, Emma Willis, Danny Dyer, and so on. And uh, what I did, I applied content analysis and discourse analysis. And it was really weird because there was no methodology to analyze whether things are sustainable or not. So I had to give, and probably most part of my work was actually thinking through how can I identify things that are sustainable, activities, suggestions, discourses, or unsustainable. But I've managed in one way or the other, and I've published that brief. It's called Fashion Media Sustainability. It has a very beautiful Victoria Beckham vector dress on the cover, in case you're wondering. And it's really short. It has pictures and it's free to download. So if you want to, you're very welcome. And I would love to hear your suggestions on the topic. I have identified 10 patterns. I will reduce them to five and you can always go into more detail in the brief. It's short um, and engaging, according to me. Right, so how does it work? One curious uh, thing that I noticed, uh, it will not perhaps surprise you if you've been following fashion media for a while. Fashion media are aspirational. Fair enough. What is the degree of aspirational here? How far away from reality should the clothes be? That's an open question. And one of the big patterns I found is all frock and no work meaning that models present outfits either in a studio or outdoors. You very often see these mythologized variations of the real cities. I mean, the Paris of uh, Simone de Beauvoir. You've got New York of, uh, I don't know, Scarlett Johansson, Woody Allen sort of movies. So you create uh, the little piece of storytelling, a fairy tale, a mythology of the city that does not exist the clothes that are not really suited for everyday life. You have imaginary um, wilderness, uh, models posting in the middle of the most beautiful lake, forests um, or palaces. Um, fair enough, fashion is about selling aspirations, selling a dream, selling those artisanal artworks, according to some um, academics of fashion. So fashion is halfway between art and consumable goods arts and crafts really halfway there. But the discourse that um, the fashion media very often create is all about the myth, all about very unpractical solution. You barely see clothes in offices or homes, two, 4% in the likes of Vogue and Grazia, just about 15% for Marie Claire and Cosmo, who are supposed to be much more democratic compared to Vogue, Elle and those like um, top league fashion magazines. 
Um, when you look at the um, the weeklies or bi-weeklies, they talk about television celebrities, uh, lots of personalities, okay, and hello. You see plenty of occasion dresses. One of the favorite genres of okay and hello is to ask a celebrity to take them into their home. And the stuff people wear to show their homes is usually a kind of new look, massive ball gown that people use just to show a reporter around and they pose you know, their sofa, next to their kitchen, next to the stove. Again, it's a kind of, it's a fun game. At the same time, it creates the idea that we all should have at least one ball gown um, in case a reporter shows up. We need to, to be exuberant in our wardrobes. Um, when you look at the balance between smart casual versus occasion dresses, you've got almost half of the coverage across all those sections of magazines and weekly magazines is the occasion dresses. So smart casual, you do have a bit, um, I guess Vogue, Elle, Marie Claire and Graz have about 60% of smart casual outfits compared to 40% of occasion wear. That is a lot. Of course, it's not representative of the everyday life for most people but that's the dream uh, we're being sold through the fashion press. The language is fascinating to observe, to explore the vocabulary, the references that they use. Of course, every media language is a sign of the times. What I've noticed is that there are three interesting patterns. They use lots of the vocabulary of religion, mental health and technology. Silicon Valley, um, iPhones, technology, AI, and whatnot are a big part of our lives, of the media discourse in the West. And you have lots of talk about the update or upgrade your wardrobe or update your lifestyle or upgrade your um, self-image, your identity. Mental health, of course, we're living in a lucky time when we can discuss mental health in the open. And you see the expressions like project confidence in Vogue, Fit in, stand out in L, treat um, cosmopolitan. And of course, the classics of the fashion world must have cult, iconic, which essentially can be boiled down to the question of um, religious vocabulary. So you've got the shrine of fashion and you've got the things that are um, a must haves for certain wardrobes. Interestingly, you still have destructive. Have all of the classic media like Marie Claire, Elle, and Graz say, do it, buy it, go now, rush. That's the thing to buy. That's the thing to have in your wardrobe. And when it's repeated every month uh, in most of the pages, 61 times per issue, Marie Claire tells you to do certain things, mostly to buy, to grasp, to fetch, and so on. That's a lot of influence, I would imagine. Elle does it about 40 times, say 25. Next, curiously enough, um, we, we live in times when people who want to be successful on social media always have to sacrifice a chunk of their personal life, of their privacy, of their intimacy. And perhaps one of the trends that's coming out of that is that fashion editors, fashion writers, they often use um, writing in first person, they disclose their own preferences. And what I saw is the result of that lots of talk of a personal choice of the editorial team. You can see a high presence of we, obsessed with, don't shop until you read this in the media sample that I have when people say, oh, that's what I am buying this season. Our team is losing their mind about this particular bag, this pair of socks, this outfit, this accessory bag, the eat bag of the season. And they don't just leave it out there as a neutral description. It's literally you think that the editor, the deputy, the subs, the writers, the proofreader, the art director, they all picked something, they went, they spent their money and they bought it. So it's an interesting merging of blogging and influencing with the traditional fashion media. At the same time, because journalists are in fashion industry, they're usually seen as the trendsetters, is the people to trust as uh, figures of authority, it looks like they really do it you know, in their everyday life. Every month they go and they buy lots of stuff. Even in some of the media, fashion editors appear in the photos modeling the goods. Speaking of the distance that's been lost between the product and the editorial judgment. And the worst offenders are men repeller, 
no longer there, actually. Marie Claire and hello. I think uh, the line is being blurred, uh, forgotten and disappearing, already disappeared. And that brings me to the next point, which is really upsetting. I would say for my profession, I one of my first jobs was writing fashion columns for Marie Claire many, many moons ago. And I really liked doing it. Uh, but I think now, again, for the commercial pressures, for the crisis of the industry, very often you see the commercialization of the media voices that results in the affiliated links. What does it mean? That when they talk about particular outfits, there is a, a hyperlink that you click on and it leads you to the website where you can buy the product. And the websites of the media companies, they register your interest. And if you buy that thing, uh, the media company will get a small fee because they led you to that part of, of the buying universe. And if you're interested, the Sun, Daily Mirror and Daily Mail have 100% of the fashion stories filled up with affiliated links, 100%. So if you ever think uh, to go to those three newspapers for your fashion advice, forget about it. Uh, you're just looking at press releases. Men Repeller uh, used to have 90%, um, which is a shame because Leandra Medin here in the photo, she started many, many years ago as an independent voice in fashion writing, really witty, really interesting, really like quirky in a good way. And then when she created a media out of it, uh, perhaps the pressures of the industry made her go down towards affiliated links route. So it was no longer independent. It was no longer editorial. It became just um, a market. Uh, the Guardian and Evening Standard uh, still maintain the reputation. To a certain extent, you've got 30% of those um, affiliated links. Refinery29, curiously enough, a digital first uh, fashion and lifestyle website coming from the US, uh, they have a London office and so on. They are much more careful, they're much more considerate and they have only just about 15% of affiliated links in their fashion stories. As you can see, um, that is literally a promotion, right? This number of commercialized presence, let's say, a literal possibility to go and buy goods, make some of this media look more like aces.com rather than independent journalism, which affects the reputation, but also brings back to our discussion that they make us buy stuff. They don't even talk about clothes as a work of art, as a creativity, as something emblematic of the generation, something to celebrate diversity, something to celebrate, celebrate inclusivity. They just sell stuff another way to sell stuff. Not all, but quite a few of those titles. And last but not least, um, you've got celebrity power. Oh my God, especially the UK media. If you can put a royal into it, you would. Uh, one of the most favorite genres, I think they get so many clicks from it. That's why it's really, really popular. Daily Mail urges you to replicate the style of a star or most often a royal person with high street clothes. Um, they literally put, uh, put aside um, kind of a picture, let's say, of Meghan Markle, Kate Middleton, or like Princess Anne these days is becoming a trendsetter. And they put uh, together an outfit from Primark, Cage and Dam, Top Shop, and so on, just to show how you can get uh, the same look, but with a bargain. Again, think about this, this gap between aspiration and everyday clothes. Same here. Right, they think that you must recreate the look of a extremely wealthy, influential, and um, distant person with a really different lifestyle. Um, television celebrities, they are also having this interesting uh, relationship with fashion. So the likes of Holly Willoughby, I mean, she was the face of Marks and Spencer recently. She's uh, very fashionable. She posts the links every day, more or less, of her looks that have been selected for her to be on screen and they contain affiliated links. So her Instagram, which is uh, followed by almost 6 million people is full of the looks of her clothes with the tags of each single piece that she's wearing. Again, probably uh, generating this urge, this trigger for people to buy more stuff. So half of her posts are those affiliated looks uh, with fashion brands. 
And interestingly, so what is this about the celebrity power that makes us so excited to follow in their footsteps and to buy things to replicate them? When we look at Instagram influencers, they rarely sell or like try to push clothes towards you intentionally. But what they do sell, and I think it's a very, um, I can't, I have a feeling I need to prove this concept, but I think it's a very British obsession with holidays. You can see it in the likes of Love Island. You can see it um, in so much programming. You can see it in so much Instagram influencing. What those uh, influencers eventually do, they are on holiday all the time. Chiara Ferragni, 17 million, a top star Italian um, fashion influencer. 94% of her photos are holiday photos. She's an entrepreneur. Her uh, medium part is being studied on business degrees. And nonetheless, what she's showing is herself being on holiday, having a great time in the most beautiful parts of the world. Bella Hadid, again, very successful, uh, powerful woman with a great career. What we mostly see is um, kind of status and job photos, uh, which is a bit of a different side of things, actually. Um, but when you look at the likes of Emily Ratajkowski, she also has lots of holidays, lots of sexualized photos. Um, what else do we have here? Sexuality actually is very prominent, whether it's Gary Ferrani, Bella Hadid, or Kim Kardashian. To be honest, all of them, apart from Rosie Huntington Whiteley and Alexa Chung, um, most of the top influencers, they promote sexuality a lot. Um, so through holidays, there would be Chiara Ferrani, there would be Emily Ratajkowski, Kendall Jenner, Bella Hadid, let's say, I was trying to say that she's also doing holidays. Not really. She's also doing lots of backstage, lots of cool places and cool things. Fair enough. Her job is taking her to different parts of the world. Um, Kardashian is selling things through her Instagram uh, about half percent of the time. But the overall impression that I got from studying like lots of those Instagram posts is that they rarely wear the same thing twice, that they mostly celebrate an extremely luxurious lifestyle. And what we mean by luxurious is access to holidays, lots of like sexualized uh, photos, some things that signal their jobs, you know, one day in Milan, one day in Ibiza, one day in, I don't know, um, Lisboa or Canary Islands or um, you know, Cuba and so on. But um, even if they don't promote clothes, we realize that the fact that they wear always new stuff uh, means that that's the part of being a cool person or being in, uh, influential or being powerful, being an authority. Yeah, looking at the question in the chat, I'll get back to that after the talk. Thank you for posting, by the way. Uh, and actually, Sustainability, I think it is present there, but much less than I thought. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny trend. Uh, you've got um, certain ideas that very often you have a magazine of 50 pages and sustainable ideas would be three pages out of this magazine. Or you have the advices that are not for everyone. Or maybe they're prohibitive because of cost. Jess Cartner Morley is the voice to follow. Um, if I may suggest, um, she's writing The Guardian and she's trying to recommend to mix the old and new to appreciate sustainability as a way to rethink, restyle rather than just buy things. Refinery29, the stylist, they are encouraging to use more ethical and crowdfunded brands. Uh, Marie Claire is looking into rental, The Times role models. So they do interviews with people who are part of these ethical brands, um, or maybe they are um, into the vintage or recycling. But still, in general, if you look at the percentage of the styling advice in the fashion shoots, buy versus restyle is three to one. So three times more likely to suggest buying things rather than restyling things. But again, coming back to my example about recycling royals, uh, there is so much confusion about what is sustainable, what is ethical, and what is lasting. Um, the sustainability is really, really tiny part of the game. 
So you see the highlights uh, of my research is that you've got all prop, no work, lots of those ball gowns, so fascinating cocktail dresses, lots of glitter. If you are a celebrity going to red carpets, makes sense. If you're a human being going to work or study, much less so. You have language of mental health, religion, and technology to aspire to make you, to convince you to buy stuff. You've got very direct, very sometimes, um, no, not sometimes. I mean, yeah, it is very ethically confusing. Endorsement by the, journal, the journalists, affiliated links, uh, direct way to buy stuff mentioned in the article, no more line between editorial and commercial, and also vocabulary in the need of guidance. The confusion, what is recyclable, what is sustainable, what is investment piece, what is green? What is greenwashing? What is going to last? What's not going to last? Um, sustainability is a really tiny trend. And uh, I'm sure you'll appreciate my graphic design skills. Uh, I don't know. I kind of keep this uh, very DIY little graph that I put together for myself just to help me whilst I was writing my work. But I think if you wanted to put them on a certain scale uh, from, you know, burning down the planet to wearing things that are not as harmful, men repel the Daily Mirror, Daily Mail would be at the bottom, whilst the Guardian, the Stylist and Refinery29, as imperfect as they are, would be showing a rather positive progressive examples. Okay, so how to do fashion ethically? Uh, it's still an open question. Maybe you have more suggestions. Ideally, more styling, less buying, more thrift, more rent, more recycling, more inclusivity, including prices, because lots of uh, ethical brands, they would have a really high price tag, 100 pounds and more for a dress for a single piece. Would be great to disentangle mental health and consumerism. So not to try to upgrade, to feel better, to realize our identity just for clothes all the time. Would be also amazing to fact check greenwashing. Um, fashion media are really relying on the old patterns nowadays. And I think it's really hard for them to reinvent themselves for the green times, for the green environment, for the crisis that we're facing right now. It will be really hard but you know the game is up for anyone who would like to give it a go and thank you very much that's a lot of information um you're very welcome to download my little work using this QR code it's free if you have any suggestions i would love to hear from you and yeah thank you mm -hmm.